Good morning and welcome to worship with the Second Presbyterian Church community in Nashville. I am Mary Louise McCullough, and I hope this time will nourish body, mind, and spirit for you as we pray and sing and listen. The late Irish poet and mystic John O'Donohue often spoke of time in terms of thresholds. He said, a threshold is not a simple boundary. It is a frontier that divides two different territories, rhythms and atmospheres. We have just crossed the threshold of Labor Day, set for us between summer and fall. But this year, that change has been quite different. Even so, the great sacrament of life remains, faithful to us, blessing us with visible signs of invisible grace. Our task is to trust. Will you pray with me, please? Holy wisdom, we bring into your presence the fullness of who we are, the hurting, the regrets, the murky and the messy, the loving, the faithful, the true, with courage and humility, we seek your guidance in the mending of the worlds between us and within us. Amen.
in times of worship, wonder, and awe, in ordinary days of work and play, in every, every, every moment, moment God, God is, is with us. us. Whether we are stuck in the mud of doubt or standing on faith's shore, in, in every place, place God, God is, is with us. us. In those who teach us and those who trouble us, in those who surprise us and those who forgive us, in, in every, every person, God, God is with us. us. time such as this is a good time to learn more about ourselves and about the dreams and hopes of others. God is always with us to lead us along. Let us pray. Loving God, sometimes it is not easy for us to admit, but deep down we know that being nice to others, even our families, can be hard. When we are together all the time, we forget to be nice. When we go to school at home, nice seems impossible. When we are worried about the future, everything is a challenge. You want us to learn to love people we barely know, but how can we when we feel anxious and alone? Help us not to long for the way things used to be. Help us to believe that today is the time to learn to face our fears. Forgive us when we yearn for things we never really needed. Help us to listen to your voice of love, the voice coming through people just like us who are learning to live all over again. Amen. God's mercy stretches out before us, making a way through touching us with grace and hope. May we trust the one who turns our fear into joy and abiding in faith. Smile. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. You, 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 the you, peace you, of Christ you, you. you. Good morning. Today's scripture is from the Old Testament, and it's about the time when God helped the Israelites cross the Red Sea. And I'm going to be reading from growing in God's love. Let's listen. Have you ever felt completely free? Like when summer vacation begins. But then, what if someone gave you chores to do? That would be the worst. That's what happens in this story. Right when the Israelites think they're free, 
Pharaoh sends his army after them. God wanted Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. But God had a plan. God sent flies and mosquitoes and locusts and hail and all sorts of terrible things, but only to the Egyptians. And finally, Pharaoh decided that it wasn't worth it. He was going to let the people go. But after they were gone, he thought, what am I doing? Who's going to do my work and make my bricks? I need the Israelites back. Quick! Pharaoh called for his fastest chariots so that he could chase after the people he had just let go. The Israelites saw them coming, and they were scared. They shouted to God, We told you something bad would happen. We should have stayed and worked for the Egyptians. Now we'll be killed by his army in the middle of nowhere. Don't be afraid, said Moses. God will protect us. You'll never have to see the Egyptians again. God heard this and said, Why are you so worried? Tell everyone to keep moving to the sea. Moses, you will part the waters so that my people will walk on dry land. God's messenger and a tall cloud that was leading the Israelites moved behind them to protect them from the Egyptians. Moses stretched his arm over the sea, and God blew the water out of the way so that the people could walk across on dry land. The Egyptians followed them. God lit the tall cloud on fire. The Egyptian army was frightened. Their chariot wheels stopped turning, and they tried to run away. God told Moses to stretch his arm over the water again. The water crashed back on the dry land, and the army drowned in the sea right in front of the Israelites. They realized what God had done for them. They believed that God was their God, and finally they trusted Moses. How does the wind sound when it blows across the water? Have you ever seen the ocean or a really big lake? And what would it look like if God blew that water out of the way? In this story, Moses was a brave leader. How can you be a brave leader? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this reminder that you are always with us and that you help us in tough times. Thank you for allowing us to trust you and to know that you will always be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Every two years, Second Presbyterian Church participates in a Habitat for Humanity build. We work for a consortium of 15 congregations, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and Hindu, known as the Unity Build. Each congregation chooses one day out of the eight days of the build to do its part. This year, our day is day five, which is Saturday, October 10th. It should be a fairly light work day, with tasks appropriate to a broad range of volunteers. We are paired with Bellevue Presbyterian, and we are seeking 15 second volunteers, including one or two hospitality coordinators to provide breakfast, lunch, and snacks. We can accept anyone over 16 years of age. Youth will be chaperoned. Information on our recipient, a Congolese immigrant named Franco Abiangama can be found in the weekly newsletter. For more information and sign-ups, contact me, David Carlton. My email is in the newsletter. Habitat builds are glorious occasions when neighbors join with neighbors to help each other and bond with each other. I invite you to embrace the experience. Please pray with us. Loving God, we seek to know you through the stories of Moses and the words of Paul. Speak to our hearts today that we may hear and follow. In your name we pray. Amen. Our first reading today is from Exodus chapter 14, 
listen for God's word to you. God's messenger, who had been in front of Israel's camp, moved and went behind them. The column of cloud moved from the front and took its place behind them. It stood between Egypt's camp and Israel's camp. The cloud remained there, and when darkness fell, it lit up the night. They didn't come near each other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord pushed the sea back by a strong east wind all night, turning the sea into dry land. The waters were split into two. The Israelites walked into the sea on dry ground. The waters formed a wall for them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians chased them and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and cavalry. As morning approached, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian camp from the column of lightning and cloud and threw the Egyptian camp into a panic. The, <clears throat> the Lord jammed their chariot wheels so that they wouldn't turn easily. The Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites because the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water comes back and covers the Egyptians, their chariots, and their cavalry. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. At daybreak, the sea returned to its normal depth. The Egyptians were driving toward it, and the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the cavalry, Pharaoh's entire army that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. The Israelites, however, walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters formed a wall for them on their right hand and on their left. The Lord rescued Israel from the Egyptians that day. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the amazing power of the Lord against the Egyptians. The people were in, the, were in awe of the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our reading from the New Testament this morning is from Paul's letter to the community of Rome, known as Romans. Let's listen as we begin in the 14th chapter. Welcome the person who is weak in faith, but not in order to argue about differences of opinion. One person believes in eating everything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Those who eat must not look down on the ones who don't, and the ones who don't eat must not judge the ones who do, because God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? They stand or fall before their own Lord, and they will stand because the Lord has the power to make them stand. One person considers some days to be more sacred than others, while another person considers all days to be the same. Each person must have their own convictions. Someone who thinks that a day is sacred thinks that way for the, the Lord. Those who eat, eat for the Lord, because they thank God. And those who don't eat, don't eat for the Lord, and they thank the Lord too. We don't live for ourselves, and we don't die for for ourselves. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to God. This is why Christ died and lived, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you look down on your brother or sister? We all stand in front of the judgment seat of God, because it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. In the Babylonian Talmud, a Jewish commentary on scripture from around the year 500 CE, the rabbis offer an interpretation of the destruction of Pharaoh's army during the Israelites' escape from Egypt through the Red Sea. Up in heaven, the rabbis say, the angels want to cheer and sing in celebration, but God is not pleased that the Egyptian army is perishing. God says, my handiwork is drowning in the sea and you would sing before me? 
This great loss of Egyptian lives is not something to celebrate to the Holy One. The soldiers are God's children, too. I found that interpretation heartening. The horror of thousands of men in chariots and foot soldiers and horse riders and horses dying, that horror was not justified in the minds of these rabbis. The Egyptians died in service to Pharaoh's rage, a tyrant's rage, something we are learning about all over again in our time. God saw that loss of life and grieved. It's an aspect of the story that has not been emphasized much as our tradition has passed it forward with the spotlight on the victory of Moses. This text from Exodus and the Romans text make a good pairing because beneath the triumphal tones that often permeate Christian interpretation of scripture, we see Moses lead his people under great duress. In truth, Moses fails to bring the people to full maturity. Generations later, Paul leads cells of new Christians through the turbulent seas of human relationships toward a future that he could imagine, but they had no way of perceiving. And Paul's victories are debatable. The life of faith is not an assurance of success or comfort. It was and is the path where we discover the faithfulness of God. And in that faith, we become more fully human. But how does that all happen? Paul was no second Moses. Unlike Moses, Paul was ambitious in thinking he could address the overarching problem of conflict and complaint, dividing families and communities and nations. The problems Moses faced and the issues Paul addressed weren't all that different. Even before the parting of the Red Sea, the people who had been slaves were already complaining. They camped along the way out of town and they looked back and they saw Pharaoh's army coming toward them and they shouted at Moses, what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt like this? It would have been better for us to work for the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses commands them to stand their ground, face the sea, face the desert. And Paul exhorts his audience of new Christians to stand their ground in Christ and to practice a shockingly radical new way of life, forgetting their social rituals and observing an unabashed hospitality that defied every social rule they had ever learned. It strikes me that it would have been even more radical than if Dr. Anthony Fauci were to suddenly urge Americans to invite all their neighbors in for dinner. Paul and these fledgling churches, Moses and the Israelites, were entering a kind of phase two, if you will. The former slaves were unconvinced that Moses or God had much to offer. They wanted to go back against all evidence that something larger and more earth-shattering than they could understand was happening. As what had been normal faded, panic rose. They craved what was familiar, predictable. Freedom, it turned out, came at a higher cost than the Israelites had imagined it. It didn't help that they were all thrown together in the desert, everyone uncomfortably together and equal, having to camp with people they didn't like and so on. So the simple comforts of home and the power to choose what went in that pot of food each week if they even had had food right away, things like that took on outsized proportions and the fires of conflict burned. And Paul, I'm convinced that these early churches were plagued by similar clashes these folks had been drawn to the teachings of Jesus. They had signed up with a movement with all the excitement and novelty and hope that went along with it. The expectation of a, a spiritual release from the grip of living in an occupied territory and the hope of a physical release. The end days were supposed to come with a victory of some sort. But when it came down to the specifics, 
and they had to look at their own ways of living, it got messy. What do you mean I can't practice my dietary restrictions as I always have and expect others to do the same when we eat together? Or if I want to worship on Sunday and he wants to worship on Saturday, why do I have to do what he does? And what does this have to do with my salvation? Richard Rohr has wisely said that when we are faced with new realities, our most common responses are mistrust, cynicism, fear, defensiveness, and dismissal. Reverting to these responses is our attempt to be in control rather than allowing this moment to teach us something new. And who wouldn't want to be in control in a time like these people faced or in our time? We can hear echoes in these texts of what many of us are experiencing in this time of COVID, whether it's in our professional relationships, our families, our neighbors, our church, our emotions, our equilibrium and resilience is frayed. It's ebbing instead of flowing. Emotions run high a lot more of the time. While fires burn their way along the West Coast, the fires of human relationship are also burning. And it's hard to keep our judging minds from running wild with distrust and anger. While some of us are just going on out there with masks, some of us want to shut the doors to all except the few we can see every day and be absolutely sure of. How much longer can we put a stopper on our freedom, our creative lives, the need for physical contact and presence, and what will be waiting for us when it's safe again? Brene Brown, whose podcasts I try to catch now when I go on walks, has named this post-Labor Day period that we have just entered Day Two. Day two was a thing in the social sciences before COVID. It was a, a process point in training of all types where people take on learning a new skill or a new discipline and they plunge in on day one with great determination and enthusiasm. And before they can come out on the other side, transformed and ready, they have to go through day two. It's part of the process. It's not an option if there's going to be real change. And day two is no fun at all. Day two is when we are in the dark. The die is cast, it's rolling, and there is no going back. There is only going forward, and we have no idea where we will end up. And right now, we're already tired as we go marching into fall because we are wired to plunge ahead with enthusiasm and pick things up and get going after Labor Day, but we're still stuck. Anxiety is rising and there's a sense of whiplash. This threshold, Labor Day, is a fizzle. Nothing is what we are used to. The COVID metrics are getting better, perhaps, but wait, no, there's still flu season ahead. And oh my gosh, after that, there's football season and crowds to contend with and more spikes and why can't people do what they need to do to help all of us get back on our feet? Brown predicts that things are gonna get weird before they get better, difficult, frustrating. We can't make our plans. And really, Moses did not have a well-developed plan to cross the desert and settle in Canaan. He was playing it day by day, often hour by hour. That is all God offered Moses because of the life that opened for them out there in the desert for 40 years was a lot more about learning to live with ambiguity than with anything else they knew. They had to learn to trust, not a naive childlike trust, but a different kind of trust a mature trust that required of them a partnership with each other and with God. Trust cannot take root and grow where there is a built-in predictable income. It can be trust, but it's different than this much deeper trust. The life God offered was a life that required all of them, Moses and the rest, 
to begin trusting in an unseen, not so self-revealing God who made promises and kept them in ways no ruler could or can. They had to grow out of the total dependency upon their masters as slaves to the, to, to the responsibilities and the ethical challenges of adult life. Phase two lasted a very long time. It was often one step forward, two steps back. It, it took the desert, the wandering, to learn how to be united for reasons other than bloodlines and common misery. They had to learn how to be a people with all their differences. The conflict and the rage that we see around us today has shown us that we still we still haven't learned to be a people. Inequities swept out of sight for generations are suddenly being laid bare. Our president embodies the divide that is active and virulent in this strange COVID drama of science versus fantasy and denial. And yet, redemption is out there too. In our hungering, God is once again inviting us to learn to ask ourselves, what am I missing? What am I called to? How can I be a part of the future that is already being built, just not the way I would prefer for it to be built? But it's being built because how we grow and change through this, or don't, is going to determine our future. I heard from a friend the other day who lost his full-time job as a therapist and the benefits that went with it, that he's now getting an insurance provider's producers, insurance producer's license. His next move will be working with a team committed to creating and protecting wealth in Nashville's black community. He'll be working with folks from Fisk, from TSU, and other historically black institutions, along with some retirement planners. The goal of this team is to help about 100 families a month in Nashville. That redemptive work is the work of the kind of stretching many of us have already felt and we all need to be doing. When we look around and see how to use what we have, what we already have, how to make good and helpful things from what is already right in front of us. Stretching stimulates creativity and innovation based on something besides ambition. It opens the future. It takes us where we can be ignited and transformed for the sake of humanity, for the sake of others. I'm here in our sanctuary today on what was supposed to be Genesis Sunday, the festive start of our church year. In the past, this has been a wonderful reunion day. Breakfast, wandering among the tables and seeing what everybody has brought to show what they're going to do during the year and seeing friends that we missed all summer, being amazed at how much our children have grown and our youth have matured and changed in three months. I miss that. I miss that so much and I know that you do too. But we are still here just not physically here. Our return to this room will not happen as soon as we had hoped, but that cannot stop us from staying together and growing together and imagining a future together, a future that may be different, learning what we can be for the world in new ways, in these ways that we're in right now, and then using our imaginations to try to say, okay, if it's not the same, what will it be and how can we serve in that world? Learning how we can walk into what seems permanently divided and be voices for unity. Learning new ways to help, to extend friendship and cheering each other on as we break out of our old ways, even though we loved them and they were great, we may break out of some of them stretch ourselves into newness. We can't go back now, and I think we know that. And there's still some grieving to do, but there is also God's promise calling us to life. 
those rabbis, they took that old story of victory and found the God who grieves, grieves with God's creation, and then teaches people how to live in this world, not the world of their making, the world constantly being created, a world of wonder and awe, a world of struggle and pain, new life, death, and resurrection. Let us trust and rediscover ourselves, rediscover the divine as we walk toward the love that never, ever fails. Let us find that love together. dreams, laid them deep into the earth behind us, said our goodbyes at the grave, but everything reminds us, God knows we ache when he asks us to go on, how do we go Join with me in prayer. Holy Trinity, God in community, as our tongues praise your name in worship, our hearts yearn for your blessing on this world. And as ever, our concerns begin close to home. We pray for the young people 
starting today as a new confirmation class and for the adults walking with them as their guides. May our confirmand's knowledge grow. May their Christian faith deepen. May their questions be honest. And may a community of love form in that group. We pray for Teresa as she faces surgery tomorrow. For Susan, continuing to recover from surgery. For Bruce, recovering from emergency eye surgery. For Barry's sister, in treatment for cancer. For JC's relatives, Mike and June, with physical and mental struggles. And for JC, who supports them. For Peggy, getting acclimated to a new home on the West Coast. For George Ann's nephew in Oregon, and for all who are in danger from the wildfires raging through the West, and for all who fight the flames, and who plan evacuations, and who care for those who have lost everything. May they be well, and all whom we love, and all whom we want to protect, and the earth that we cherish. In this world on fire, literally, politically, medically, socially, we all crave the cooling rain of your spirit, O oh God. Grant us the courage to love the people around us, to live responsibly during the pandemic, always working for the safety of others. May we look down on no one, but pray for those we don't understand, even our enemies. Grant us the honesty to confront our own ignorance, especially about racial justice and the experiences of our siblings of color. Strengthen us and all your people with the gracious spirit of your son, Jesus Christ, as we pray in his own words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It takes a village of us to create a worship service like this. Thanks to all of you who've been involved today. It also takes a village of all of us to be Christ's church. We invite your ongoing financial stewardship of this community of faith. If you have not yet set up a version of electronic giving, we encourage you to do that because it can make things easy for both you and for the church staff. Here are three ways that you can give to 2PC electronically. You can send a text message to 615-606-7473. It is possible to give money via text messaging, and you can learn more about it by sending a text to that number. Second, you could give through our website, secondpresbyterian.net. Every week in the bulletin, there is a link to clicking through to give there, or you can just go to the site and click on Give to 2PC. Third, you can um, contact the church office and work on setting up an automated contribution from any account that you desire. Um, you can get the contact info from the website, and we would invite you to do that um, as a means of evening out and simplifying our financial lives together. All of our gifts pooled together make possible ministries of worship and care and justice and artistry and hope. May the mission of Jesus Christ be furthered by what we can offer together.
join us at noon today, Sunday the 13th of September, for our annual congregational meeting to elect a new class of elders. The nominating committee has put forth a slate of wonderful nominees for these positions. Once elected, they serve three-year terms on the session, which is the discernment and leadership body for a local Presbyterian church. So you'll find the Zoom link for that congregational meeting um, near this video, depending where you're watching it, and or in recent emails from the church this week. Please also on the social media sites um, for the church, our Facebook page and our Instagram feed, um, and also the email um, weekly newsletters from the church. Look at all of those for timely announcements of things that are happening. I will highlight just two right now. One is a four-week class on the Apostle Paul. It will start this coming Saturday, um, September 19th at 10 o'clock a.m. on Zoom. It's a joint offering with Downtown Presbyterian Church, and it will be led by Phil Orr, Mary Louise McCullough, and Mike Wilson. You can email emily at secondpresbyterian.net to sign up for the Zoom link and to join that class. And second announcement I'll highlight is if you want to learn more about this church family, about Second Presbyterian, um, and you might even consider joining as a member of this church, um, you are welcome to take part in our Inquirers class on October the 11th at 9.30 a.m., again via Zoom. And again, you can email emily at secondpresbyterian.net if you'd like to take part. Joining that class um, does not at all obligate you to go ahead and join the church, but it's a great way to learn more and to find out what that would mean. And now, Mary Louise will send us off with a blessing from God. Friends, we are called to life, life in abundance, even in times such as these. May your heart know the peace in the heart of the universe and may you open to the life opening for you this day and all days. And may you see God's love, Christ's way, and may you feel the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit all around you now and forevermore. And know that you are blessed. Thanks be to God and amen. <laughs>